How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here once again. This time we're going to take a look at uses for radioisotopes. So remember that radioisotopes just mean radioactive isotopes. So our objectives are describe different uses for radioisotopes, specifically these ones. These are the ones that are probably of most interest, especially in the course you're taking. All right, cool. So let's take a look. Radioisotopes. There's uh, certain properties of radioactivity that are potentially dangerous, right? Radiation, you probably know, is a dangerous thing, but they can also be potentially useful. We can use radiation to do some things that we may want to have happen. So let's take a look at how. So carbon-14 is used in radioactively dating biological remains. So because, you know, biological remains contain carbon, carbon-14 can be found in it. So carbon-14 is made in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays bombard nitrogen with neutrons. So the cosmic radiation has neutrons flying through space. They come into our atmosphere. They collide with nitrogen, and it turns it into carbon-14. So carbon-14 is then taken up by plants during photosynthesis. The plants incorporate this carbon-14 into their tissues, and when other living organisms eat those plants, they incorporate that carbon-14 into them as well. So once these organisms die, they stop taking in carbon-14. So they have this kind of steady state carbon-14 that they're living with. And when they die, they're not adding any carbon-14 to themselves. Carbon-14 decays. And we can take a look at how much carbon-14 has decayed to determine the age of the sample. All right, we got uranium-238, which is a radioisotope that's made when stars explode in supernovas, right? So it decays to become stable lead-206. And the half-life is about 4.47 billion years, so it's a really long half-life. So the reason that becomes useful is we can, we can use uranium-238 and look at how much lead-206 it decayed into to determine how much time has gone by. If I have this much uranium-238 left and I have this much to lead-206 made, you can see how much time has gone by, and you can use that to date and figure out how old some geological samples are. This is really helpful in rocks and stuff that it's gonna be really, really old. We have iodine-131. So iodine-131 is useful in diagnosis and treatment of hyperthyroidism or thyroid cancer or other thyroid disorders. And the reason it's useful is because the thyroid needs a lot of iodine. So if we use radioactive iodine, it'll target that gland specifically more so than the rest of our uh, organs in our body. So the thyroid is like a thermostat for the body's metabolism. The thyroid tells it, hey, speed up, slow down, burn up more energy or, you know, slow it down so we can save it. And iodine is an important element used by the thyroid in order to do so. So it's selectively absorbed into that organ more so than it would be like our, our stomach or our brain or our kidneys. The thyroid needs that iodine. So iodine-131 is administered to the patient and it'll be absorbed by the thyroid and the radiation will kill any tumor cells if you have a tumor in, a, in the thyroid, as well as if you had like hyperthyroidism, it's gonna weaken the thyroid cells. So it's gonna slow down your metabolism, which will help account uh, and negate the hyperthyroidism. So I-131, think the thyroid. Cobalt-60 is synthetically made. So this is a radioactive isotope that you won't find in nature. In order to get it, we got to make it. And it's used in radiotherapy for the treatment of cancer as well as food irradiation. So food that's, you know, been bombarded with radioactivity, you can kill any of the germs that are on the food, and the food itself won't be radioactive. It'll just be, you know, kill any of the pests. And what I think is pretty cool about the cobalt-60 treatment is in this part right here, they have some cobalt-60, and it's shooting off radiation. Now, normally, if there was a tumor, say right here in the patient, if you just kept shooting the radiation in one direction, all of the tissue in the way is going to get damaged by that radiation as well. But this thing is going to spin around the body, so it's constantly going to target that one part of the patient, and the radiation to the rest of the body is going to be a lot less, but it's going to be focused where the tumor is so that you can get higher doses of radiation where the tumor is and still not have a super high radiation to the rest of the body, the different parts of the body. Technetium-99 is used in medical imaging and can be used to image blood vessels, the brain, and it can also be helped to find tumors. So those are the big things for Technetium-99. So it's got a short half-life, which is good for keeping dosage low in patients. So you give them this radioactive stuff, will help image and find the tumor in the blood vessels, 
but you don't have to worry about it sticking around in the patient too long because it's got a very short half-life. All right, americium-241 is really cool. It's a key component in the use of smoke detectors, and I encourage you to check out the engineer guy on YouTube, how smoke detectors work. It's really, really fascinating. Uh, but basically, we have this source of radioactivity. It's giving off particles. And on the other side, we have a sensor. So if this is picking up radiation, everything is good. The alarm isn't sound. But when we get smoke going into the smoke detectors, it stops this radiation from going all the way through. The smoke detector goes, hey, what happened to that? There must be smoke in the way. Give off an alarm. Beep, 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 beep. And that's how smoke detectors work. Plutonium-239 is used almost exclusively in nuclear weapons. Uh, so, yeah, the, here's a, an example of a, a plutonium bomb. They usually are more complicated with their construction, so making a plutonium bomb is usually more difficult than making a uranium bomb. But the pluton, plutonium-239 is usually, um, you know, you can get it maybe easier in some breeder reactions and stuff. We got uranium-235, which is also used in nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants, and it makes up about less than a percent of natural uranium. So in order to use it, we have to enrich it. So if you've ever heard enriched uranium, that's what they're talking about. Uranium-238 is the most abundant radio, or I'm sorry, the most abundant uranium isotope. It's about 99% of it, and it's not directly usable as a nuclear fuel, uh, but it's usable in radioactively dating rocks and stuff. So to summarize, can you describe the different uses for radioisotopes, including cobalt-60, iodine-131, technetium-99, plutonium-239, uranium-235, uranium-238, carbon-14, and americium-241? I hope so. And if not, uh, watch it again. Take some notes. All right? Okay. I'll see you in class. Goodbye. Okay,